Thank you all very much for being here. There's some note cards coming around with some pens if you'd like to um, jot down a question at some point. Uh, and then later on in our evening, I'll collect the cards and I'll pick the questions that I wanted to ask and then we'll use those for the ambassador. So it's a pleasure to welcome you all here tonight and uh, I wanna thank you on behalf of the congregation for coming up after whatever it was that you did today um, to come up and battle traffic and everything else to be here. Uh, and, then, and then I'm sorry if it was hard for you to park, uh, but here you are. And we really are in for a treat and we have a great opportunity. So I wanna say a few words about Ambassador Grappo and, uh, and then give him an opportunity to share some thoughts. And then at the end, we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. I met Gary Grappo in October of 2010 through our mutual friends, Julie and Wally. Um, Wally since passed away, a blessed memory. Um, they were congregates of mine in Los Altos Hills and they were coming to Israel for a visit and uh, my family and I had moved to Israel the year before and so Julie and Wally sent an email saying we're coming to Israel and we'd love to get together, maybe we can have lunch and oh by the way, we were gonna invite our friends who have just moved to Israel and they mentioned that their friend Gary was you know, involved in diplomacy and government and uh, wanted to know if Gary and Becky could join us for the meal and I said that'd be fantastic. Um, and we uh, went out for lunch and I learned over lunch that uh, Gary was working with Tony Blair as part of the quartet, got a chance to talk with Becky and make a connection and then that night we had Shabbat dinner together um, and Wally and Julie and, and Gary and Becky came over and it was the beginning of a really beautiful friendship. Um, we got a chance to spend some time with Gary and Becky in their home in Abu Tor. And I don't know if you remember this, Gary, but it was right around Halloween time and you guys got a, a big pumpkin for my daughters because they have pumpkins in Israel, but they don't look like our pumpkins. And so if you want to carve one, it's a bit of a problem. Halloween is obviously not a Jewish or Israeli holiday, but try telling that to your six-year-old. So you saved us because you got us a beautiful pumpkin that we, uh, that we carved. Our neighbors were looking at us like, what are you doing and why is there a candle in your pumpkin? Um, When the, deals, when the details of the Iran deal came to light, Gary was the very first person I thought to invite to our temple to help us understand the context and the details of the agreement in, in a deeper way. So I wanna share a few reasons why Gary was the first one who came to mind for me. Here are some of the things that Ambassador Grappo brings to the conversation about the Iran deal and more broadly about the Middle East. Um, he's a, diplomat with many years of experience uh, and of service on behalf of the United States. His postings include some of the most difficult foreign policy challenges of our time. He's been posted to Nicaragua during the Contra War, uh, during the period of the fall of the Soviet Union, and uh, the bulk of his career was in the Middle East. He's a fluent Arabic speaker and has served in a variety of diplomatic capacities, from Jordan to Iraq to Saudi Arabia, in 2006, he began his ambassadorship in the Sultanate of Oman, where he served for three years. Oman, um, if you haven't been there, uh, Ambassador Grappo recommends traveling because uh, it's a beautiful country and uh, very warm people. Um, but it's very close to Iran, right across the Persian Gulf. So he knows the region exceedingly well. And then from 2009 to 2012, and this was the period that Jacqueline and I got to know Gary and Becky, he was the head of mission of the office of the quartet representative to the, uh, for the Honorable Tony Blair in Jerusalem and spent three years in the region. He's received numerous awards during his foreign service career. Uh, he received the Secretary's Career Achievement Award for distinguished service throughout his career, which is one of the highest honors that a diplomat can receive from the Secretary of State. Uh, he received the Senior Foreign Service Presidential Award um, for his work as ambassador to Oman and the State Department Superior Honor Award for his leadership role in combating terrorism, uh, terrorism financing in the Middle East. Gary also has a background in banking. Um, and so uh, that, was, uh, that was an area of focus for his leadership. 
He's currently the CEO and founder of Equilibrium International Consulting, um, which he founded soon after his retirement from the State Department. Um, Gary earned a Bachelor of Science degree from the United States Air Force Academy in 1972. And um, we actually, we were talking about this on the way up here, it's possible that um, we met during that period because I was born at the United States Air Force Academy uh, in 1969. And uh, it's maybe my father took care of Gary when he was a cadet. Um, he received his MS from the uh, Purdue University in geodesy and survey engineering. And I did not know what, am I pronouncing it right, geodesy? I did not know what that is. I'm sure you all do. But um, thankfully, the internet is filled with wonderful, wonderful resources. And I found out it's the science of accurately measuring and understanding three fundamental properties of the Earth, its geometric shape, its orientation in space, and its gravity field. Does that sound right? I love Wikipedia. And uh, it's why you have an expertise in GPS, I understand now, because that was your um, background there, and you served as an engineer. And you also um, um, have a degree in engineering. And an MBA from uh, Stanford's Graduate School of Business, which is where you met our mutual friends, Julie and Wally. Um, Gary is married to Becky, and together they are the parents of three children, Michelle, Alex, and Christina. And before I ask the ambassador to come up, I want to share one more thing, and then we're going to get to hear from the ambassador. And as I said at the end, I'll be taking uh, cards from you if you have questions uh, about anything that the ambassador shares with us. But I wanted to um, immediately proceed the ambassador's comments with a poem from Yehuda Amichai, which is one of my favorite poems of his, and I think it's a helpful way to frame our conversation because this is obviously a topic that there's a lot of passion behind, and it's because of our love for Israel, it's because of our love for the United States, it's because for our love of humanity and, and our hopes for peace and for security, not just for our family and friends in Israel, but for people all over the region and all over the world, we're passionate about this topic. And uh, sometimes that can lead to uh, conflict because we care so deeply. So this is a poem about, about that. It's called Hamakom Shebo Anu Tzodkim, The Place Where We Are Right, by Yehuda Amichai. From the place where we are right, flowers will never grow in the spring. The place where we are right is hard and trampled like a yard. But doubts and loves dig up the world like a mole, a plow, and a whisper will be heard in the place where the ruined house once stood. Ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador Gary Grappo. Well, thank you very much, Yoshi, for your very kind remarks and actually for the very uh, moving poem. Uh, uh, I'd like a copy of that. Um, I might send it to my friends in the Middle East, by the way. Um, well, good evening, and it's a real honor and pleasure to be with you here uh, this evening uh, to talk about a subject that I know uh, is very much on the minds of all Americans and many of our friends, of course, in, in, in the Middle East, not the least of which um, the people of Israel. Uh, this is a subject that I think we can all agree is probably one of the most consequential foreign policy national security issues uh, in a very, very long time. And I say that with the knowledge of Iraq uh, and everything else that's going on in the Middle East and elsewhere in the world. Um, as someone who spent nearly 20 years living in, and, uh, and are working on the Middle East, I believe that the Iran nuclear agreement, or by its official name, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, has repercussions that will extend far into the future, longer, in fact, than most of its pr uh, provisions, almost all of which expire in 15 years. Let me begin by saying that uh, I don't want to convince anyone uh, this evening uh, about the rightness or wrongness of this agreement or change anyone's mind. Uh, rather, what I hope to do is to offer some background and perspectives on issue that may be useful to you as you assess for yourselves whether this agreement is the right one or not and what to do about it. I'll share with you as well my own personal view 
which I will admit I only recently arrived at after weeks of conflicted reflection and considerable study. Before speaking about the details of the agreement and its pros and cons, uh, I'd like to discuss the lead up to this agreement. This is important because it gives us insights to the motivations of some of the sides, especially Iran, and why it came to pass when and as it did. And I'd like to go back to May of 2003. You'll recall that this is just barely two months after the successful American invasion of Iraq and the toppling of the despotic regime of Saddam Hussein. Those were very heady days for the US administration, especially since the Iraqis were welcoming us as the liberators we genuinely considered ourselves to be. We had rid the country of their much despised dictator, and, but of course it was not long afterwards that the wheels came off the invasion bus and this conflict spiraled, uh, spiraled out of control. But in May of 2003, matters could not have been better for Washington. I was serving in Washington at the time. And boy, we, everybody was just, you just don't see times like that. Like it went according to plan, even though it, it didn't, it wasn't exactly the plan. Um, in Tehran, however, the American steamrolling of Saddam was met with sober fear and considerable soul searching. If the Americans could knock off Saddam and his heralded Iraqi Republican Guard Corps in just days, they must have asked themselves, what might they do to us? So in that month, a very strange fax appeared on a US government machine in Washington. In fact, I believe it was there in the State Department. Uh, it came from the Swiss ambassador in Tehran because we don't have an official presence anywhere in Iran, the Swiss represent our interests in Iran. That usually means uh, addressing the needs of Americans who either live or visit there, and then passing the occasional communication uh, back and forth between um, Tehran and Washington. But that fax outlined a proposal, and the proposal was to sit down with the United States and negotiate all outstanding issues between the United States and Iran. That included Iran's support for terrorist groups like Hezbollah, Hamas, and others, and it even proposed accepting the principle of land for peace in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But most important for us uh, here this evening, the proposal also included an offer of full transparency in its then NASA nuclear development program. Now the Americans, that would be the White House, the State Department, and the CIA were obviously baffled by the facts, not only by its contents, but also by the manner in which such a potentially far-reaching proposal from a hostile state was delivered. Uh, it came by facts. Um, we see a lot of odd things in diplomacy, and uh, you just don't ever see a proposal for a virtual peace agreement coming from a country like this. The only analogy I can come up with is if we had received a postcard from Japan in 1944 offering to surrender. Uh, so, uh, so we wondered, was this real? Could it be genuine? And who in Iran could have authorized such a communication? Was it the Swiss ambassador simply trying to make his mark in history by tempting the United States to enter into some kind of discussion with the Iranians. Well, we didn't know then, but subsequent research and revelations suggest that it was genuine and had been approved apparently at the highest levels of the Iranian leadership. But the U.S. administration chose to ignore it. We had assessed that it was not genuine and that had the Iranians truly been serious, they would have used channels already in place to communicate a message of such import. This would have been through the United Nations or some of the very quiet, discreet channels we had set up either through our intelligence organizations or the State Department. Uh, I, I can't say for sure either, but apocryphal or not, the proposal illustrates a foundational belief within the Iranian leadership. It is one, in fact, that is common to all governing authorities, whether democratically elected by 
or forcefully imposed on its citizens, and that's self-preservation. Ever since the 1979 Islamic Revolution, the Iranian leadership has been consumed with the fear of being removed, either by internal forces, like the revolution that they capitalized on to topple the Shah, or by external forces. Now, they have managed to deal very effectively and forcefully and ruthlessly with any possible internal movement, setting up a regime that would have been the envy of the Shah to remove any possible challenge, even down to the single blogger posting harmless criticism on Facebook. But the leadership always believed that it was the U.S. that posed the most serious threat. And in their view, America was intent on regime change, just as we had done in Iraq in 2003. So if negotiating with the great Satan was the only way to keep the Americans from replicating our Iraq strategy in Iran in 2003, then the heretofore intransigent mullahs were prepared to do it, as long as they, of course, remained in power. That we may have missed an historic opportunity 12 years ago seems obvious to us today, certainly not back then. And shame on us, shame on us for not having at least pursued it. It's worth noting, by the way, Iran at that time, in 2003, had 700 centrifuges. None of them were in operation. When we began the formal negotiations within the P5 plus one with Iran, in 2014, they had over 19,000 centrifuges, uh, almost 10,000 of which were in operation. And they had new generations, the IR4, 6, and 8, either ready to be installed or at advanced stages of development within the country. Now, there is imp another critically important lesson in all of this as well. As I've said, the Iranian regime seized was seized with self-preservation. So the other lesson of 2003 is that when Tehran offers to negotiate, they must either see an opportunity for something beyond just an agreement, or as they did in 2003, a threat necessitating reviewing previously closed options. Now with the election of President Obama in 2008, Iran witnessed two things. First, the new president, repeatedly indicated his willingness to negotiate with his Iranian counterparts. And later, he would even allow for limited, continued Iranian uranium enrichment. And second, the new president appeared disinclined to speak seriously about the so-called all options being on the table when it came to dealing with Iran's patently obvious pursuit of a nuclear weapons program. Tehran, I believe, saw its chance. The president had effectively removed the one bargaining chip that Iran could never neutralize, and that was our overwhelming military advantage. Even today, the United States possesses the undeniable ability to inflict significant damage on Iran's military forces, including its vaunted Islamic Revolutionary Guard, and on much of their infrastructure and command and control systems. And that's without using nuclear weapons or placing one American boot on the ground. Moreover, aside from threatening asymmetric warfare, that is, a heightened use of terrorism, there would be little Tehran could do to prevent that. Of course, our allies in, in the region would suffer, and most likely some serious repercussions. It was an advantage that I don't think this administration fully appreciated, and it clearly did not since our president effectively took it off the table. Now, in my experience as a diplomat with um, a fair amount of understanding of uh, negotiation, I learned many valuable lessons, but one especially important one. And by the way, I also picked it up at business school at Stanford. You never surrender an advantage. And I think the Iranians understood this as well, because as far back as 2009, our friends in Oman, where I was ambassador at the time, began hinting to us that Iran was interested in talking. If the Americans, under their new and inexperienced president, were willing to remove the one great advantage they employed over Iran, they enjoyed over Iran, then it was time to move and move quickly. The playing field had suddenly become almost level. 
the increasing effectiveness of the UN Security Council san sanctions, 11 dating back to 2006, and not counting the separate sanctions imposed by the United States and the EU, which were far more onerous, only made the imperative of the logic greater. Now was the time to negotiate. Previous negotiations with the EU plus three, this would be the EU Commission plus the UK, France, and Germany, dating back to 2005, had all failed. And even when the other members of the Security Council, the United States, Russia, and China joined in 2009, little headway was made. But at the urging of Oman Sultan Qaboos, a gentleman whom I got to know very, very well, Iran's supreme leader, the Grand Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, agreed in 2011 to private meetings with the United States. The first of these took place in Oman in March of 2012, even before, by the way, the election of their new president, the current president, uh, Rouhani. These meetings continued in Oman with officials at even higher levels and became more serious. In a March 2013 meeting, a personal message from President Obama was delivered in which he formally offered to allow a limited enrichment program in Iran. Following Rouhani's assumption of the Iranian presidency in August 2013, by the way, he hadn't known about any of this and was shocked when he was told, when he became president, that this was happening. But he clearly saw the opportunity and he moved extremely quickly. The, the negotiations became more serious and ultimately led to an interim agreement in November of 2013 known as the Joint Plan of Action. That plan, signed on to by the other world powers, called for continued negotiations between the P5 plus one and Iran toward a final comprehensive agreement within six months. Now those negotiations, of course, were extended twice, July 2014 and again in November of 2014. And at that point, the sides pledged to conclude a final agreement by June 2015. And ultimately, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the so-called Iran Nuclear Agreement, was finally concluded in July uh, of this year. So what's in it? What did the Iranians commit to do? And what did the rest of the uh, parties to the agreement commit to do? Well, for a period of 10 years, Iran will maintain no more than 5,060 operating centrifuges for enriching uranium and only at one site, Natanz. That's about half the current number they have in operation today. Iran will also limit or will limit the enrichment level to 3.7%, which would be enough for any civilian nuclear power plant, but not anywhere near the grade necessary for producing a weapon. And they will limit this enrichment of 3.7% level for 15 years. Iran will also cap its stockpile of low enriched uranium, the 3.7%, at 300 kilograms, or about 660 pounds. It's about, 90, it's about a 98% reduction of the stockpile they have today. They will maintain this level for 15 years, and we consider this, the U.S. and others, uh, a level insufficient for any rush on Iran's, Iran's part to build a bomb, a uh, nuclear bomb. Iran will also be forced to transform its deeply buried plant, buried plant at Fordow to a center for nuclear physics and science research. They'll be able to keep 1,066 of these first generation centrifuges there, but they will not be permitted to enrich or to spin any uranium. They will be using it for other materials for scientific research. Iran also commits to redesign and rebuild the Iraq reactor so it will not produce weapons-grade plutonium. It will render the original reactor core there, which would enable the production of weapons-grade weapons plutonium, inoperable. But it will be able to keep the reactor in Iran. Iran will ship out of the country the Iraq reactor spent fuel, which could have been used to build a bomb. And it has pledged not to build any heavy water reactors for 15 years. The Iranian government will provide the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, greater access and information regarding its nuclear program and allow the agency to investigate suspicious sites or allegations 
of covert facilities related to uranium enrichment anywhere in the country. It will give inspectors access to the supply chain that supplies its nuclear program, including all uranium mines and mills, and will allow continuous surveillance of centrifuge manufacturing and storage facilities. And some of these surveillance measures will last up to 20 and even 25 years. All of these measures are intended to restrict Iran's so-called breakout, uh, breakout capacity to one year. This refers to the country's ability to surreptitiously rush to build, a, uh, to build an operational nuclear weapon. That one year is considered adequate by Western authorities, intelligence agencies, to detect any such dash to build a bomb. Today, that breakout capacity is estimated between two and three months. Now, Iran, of course, gets something in return. And the most important thing they will get is the lifting of all nuclear sanctions once the IAEA has certified to the UN Security Council that, it has, that Iran has fulfilled the agreement's requirements on reducing its, fil its facilities and stockpiles. Uh, it's estimated that it will take Iran six to 12 months to do all the things necessary to meet those requirements. Another thing that Iran receives out of this that was not anticipated until the very, throughout the negotiations, but was able to receive toward the end of the negotiations, is the ability to import conventional arms in five years and missile technology in eight years. In my opinion, and those of many other experts more expert than I, many others more expert than I, including even critics of the agreement, these restrictions are adequate to prevent Iran from building a nuclear weapon for at least 10 years and probably closer to 15 years. Therefore, for the limited period in which these restrictions apply, the agreement may be con considered a success. As all of you know, uh, know, however, this agreement has a number of flaws. And I'm going to list some of those that I've identified and, of course, many others as well. First of all, the agreement leaves Iran's nuclear infrastructure largely in place. It allows Iran to continue research and development. So effectively, this agreement le legitimized what Iran has been doing illegally for 12 years. This is in violation of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, to which it is a party, and the dozen or so UN Security Council resolutions that I mentioned earlier. Because it gives Iran the ability to ramp up quickly once the various restriction periods expire, I believe this is the agreement's greatest flaw. We should expect that sanctions will largely be removed in six to 12 months once Iran can, uh, the IAEA certifies to the UN Security Council that the Iranians have met their requirements for removing stockpiles and modifying their facilities. Uh, and once those sanctions are lifted, uh, it will leave us with little leverage to enforce this agreement. And there's little confidence that the so-called snapback mechanism for reimposing sanctions in the event of Iranian violation, especially as we get further down the road. If we were to invoke these snapback sanctions, Iran will have the right under this agreement to break all of its commitments. The agreement provides for no measured way to reimpose sanctions in the event of small or modest infractions on the part of Iran, only for reimposing sanctions that will already have been lifted. The promised anytime, anywhere inspections, that didn't happen. Uh, instead, the IAEA must often announce when it's coming, and in the event of a dispute, the IAEA must, may have to wait as long as 24 days before visiting a suspicious site or activity. A secret inspections regime agreement was negotiated between Iran and the IAEA and has not been shared, shared with the Congress, as is required by the Iran Nuclear Agreement Act of 2015. That secret agreement describes how key questions about the past military dimensions of, Iran, of Iran's nuclear pro, uh, program, including at Parchin and other military sites, will be resolved. It also addresses the pr 
precise operational parameters of the verification regime to which Iran will be subject at those military sites. For example, it has been reported that Iranians under IAEA supervision and not IA super, IAEA inspectors will conduct inspection at those types of sites. The deal also could further militarize and nuclearize the region. Governments in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere in the region may see Iran will acquire the ability to become a nuclear-capable state in 10 to 12 years. They might begin planning accordingly, including the development of their own nuclear weapons program. They will also insist, as they will claim it's their right, that they be given the same opportunities as Iran, including the ability to enrich uranium and conduct advanced research and development. Such actions further diminish the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, which in turn will heighten the danger of a nuclearized Middle East. Another issue of great concern is that when the sanctions are lifted, something on the order of 100 to $150 billion will be released to the Iranians. This is mostly money that the United States holds, but also um, a European governments. And these will flow into Iranian coffers. Um, in that six to 12 month period. And that does not include revenue that the Iranians will, will earn from uh, their ability to re-export increased amounts of oil and gas. So we should expect at least a modest portion of that to go to the IRGC for weapons and activities abroad, as well as to Hezbollah in uh, Lebanon and elsewhere, Assad in Syria, and the Shia militia in Iraq, and many other nefarious causes all inimical to U.S. interests and those of our allies. Furthermore, allowing Iran to import missile technology in as few as eight years and conventional weapons in five will make dealing with their dangerously adventurous activities in the region that much more difficult. And finally, Iran's past nuclear and possible military dimensions of its nuclear program are left unresolved and to settlement with the IAEA under this so-called roadmap. So, in my view, the agreement seems based on hope that it will change Iranian behavior. That is, that this is a transformational agreement and that it will change Iran and then the way Iran behaves in the world today. And if that is accurate, then truly this is an historic agreement and should be viewed that way. Yet there's been no evidence so far that anything of the sort is or will be taking place. For Iran, this is a transactional agreement. It allows it to continue behaving essentially as it has since 1979, only without UN sanctions, but of course with a temporarily constrained uh, nuclear program. And one need only read recent comments from Iranian Supreme Leader Khamenei of America's supreme arrogance and his, and his intention to prevent any further thawing in Iran-U.S. relations. By the way, I've always been struck by his, he often refers to our supreme arrogance, but he claims the title of supreme leader. Uh, most of our monotheistic faith, faiths believe that there's only one being deserving of the title supreme. Be that as it may, uh, in, the, in the coming days, Congress is going to have to decide on a motion to disapprove this agreement. Both houses appear very likely, if it comes to a vote, to disapprove. In the Senate, however, there are clearly enough opposition votes to prevent the required two-thirds majority that would overturn a presidential veto if that were necessary. Of course, now we know that there's a very strong possibility of a filibuster in the Senate, meaning that the decision would never come up for a vote in the Senate, and the president will never have to exercise his veto authority. So for all intents and purposes, this agreement is going to stand. Broadly speaking then, here is what can be said. On the one hand, the agreement offers clear short to medium term advantages by limiting the ability of a hostile state to acquire nuclear weapons. On the other hand, it does not achieve what many, including the president himself, had considered its principal objective preventing Iran from ever acquiring a nuclear weapon. So as concerned citizens, what are we to make of this agreement? 
Before answering that question, I think it's useful to step back for a moment and to consider our role in this agreement and what it could mean for America's role in the world today. Now, I'm going to confess that as a former American diplomat accustomed to implementing an aggressive foreign policy on a very wide range of issue, issues, I believe in American exceptionalism. I do because I don't believe any nation in the world today can play the critically essential role that we, the United States, do of ensuring global peace, stability, and prosperity, even when we sometimes, in fact, many times, fall short. Nor would I want any other nation to play that role. Polls conducted worldwide repeatedly show that people around the world, while they may have serious concerns and even strong criticisms, of American foreign policy do not wish America to relinquish our role as the, as the global leader. In fact, they don't trust any nation or organization, not Russia, not China, not the UN, and not even the EU, to step into that role. This mantle of leadership is sometimes proactively, aggressively worn by us, and at other times, unwillingly placed upon us. But however we may feel about it, it's a fact that we cannot and should not ignore. Fundamentally, it serves our interests. Therefore, I submit that if the United States were to repudiate the nuclear agreement with Iran, one, one which we very actively pursued and whose negotiations we effectively led from start to finish, that role would be seriously undermined. I say this understanding that we might indeed be fully justified in rejecting what is to the majority of America, the majority of our Congress, and many of our most important allies in the region, a seriously defective agreement. If the U.S. Were, walk, were to walk away from this agreement, two things would happen. First, none of the other P5 members, not even our closest partners, the U.K. or France, would consider reopening negotiations. They've, in fact, told us that. All would proceed with lifting their respective sanctions. And, of course, UN sanctions would also be lifted. Second, Iran, Iran would be given the luxury of two choices. It could ratchet up its nuclear arms activities without any constraint, or more likely, at the outset, proceed with implementing its obligations under the accord, even without the lifting of US sanctions. Iran would be seen as taking the high road. The resulting effect would not only neutralize any attempt we might make to constrict the agreement's implementation or to negotiate a new agreement, but also cause, in my view, significant damage to America's image and standing in the world. We would have few supporters outside of Israel and a few silent Arab states. Moreover, we might face obstacles in constraining Iran's other activities, especially its support for terrorism. We would become isolated on an issue of critical national security and foreign policy importance. So if we should not then reject a weak agreement, what can we do? Now, various experts have proposed some pretty good ideas, and I'd like to share some of those and a few of my own with you. None of these would require reopening the negotiations. First of all, I believe it's imperative that the President state unambiguously and make it an essential component of U.S. policy doctrine in the region that the United States will use all necessary measures to prevent Iran from ever acquiring a nuclear weapon. Then working with our own government and then within our own government and following up with our European allies we should establish a rigorous program for closely monitoring and enforcing this agreement, especially with respect to reimposing sanctions when Iran falls short of any of its obligations. The U.S. must devote considerably more resources and effort to intelligence collection of Iran's activities. We should strengthen our cooperative intelligence arrangements with our closest allies in Europe, of course with the IAEA, and our allies in the region, most especially Israel which has the most to lose from a deficient agreement. 
all should make clear our intent to take serious infractions on Iran's part to the UN Security Council, including the possible reimposition of Chapter 7. The administration, backed by congressional assent and our allies in the P5 plus 1, should make it clear that we will take any Iranian weaponization effort, regardless of how small, to the UN Security Council for immediate action. Working with our allies around the world, the U.S. must lead a campaign to impose greater restrictions and harsher sanctions on Iran for its support of terrorism. In particular, we must ensure that none of Iran's newly acquired financial resources are permitted to reach terrorist organizations or Assad's regime in Syria. The U.S. must enter into a different strategic dialogue with Israel, including potentially offering the Jewish state defense equipment not previously considered. And finally, as I believe we may already have done in the meeting last week between President Obama and King Salman of Saudi Arabia, we'll need to have a ramped up strategic dialogue with our Arab allies in the region, including stepped up military and intelligence cooperation and a reevaluation of various types of weapon sales consistent with the security interests of Israel. I honestly believe that our leadership did not negotiate the best agreement it could. There are theories as to why, but speaking quite honestly, as a, as a uh, practitioner of diplomacy, um, I'm leaving that question to, uh, to the historians. We are left with it and must find a way to make it work in the very best possible manner. I'll point out that this president likely will not have to live with any unfortunate consequence of this agreement. That will be le left, or that will be the responsibility of his successors, extend extending out for the next 20 to 25 years. Therefore, as we all consider the next person to lead our nation, we should look carefully at the candidate's position on the Iran nuclear agreement and ask ourselves, is it practical? Is it implementable? And will it serve the best interest of the United States and advance the cause of peace and stability in this vital but tragically conflicted region. And I'm ready to take some questions. So we'll start with some, some questions that I collected. If you have questions that you've written down, you can pass them up, and Rabbi Stern, thank you for helping to pick up some of the cards. Um, a question about um, how much longer the sanction, uh, how much longer sanctions could have been extended, do you think? And had we continued to just hold to the sanctions, would that have, quote unquote, worked? The, uh, the administration has claimed that the, that the sanctions regime was beginning to weaken, that, um, that various members of the P5, uh, particularly Russia and China, um, the P5 plus one, because I want to include Germany, were beginning to waffle. Uh, quite honestly, I didn't see the waffling within the EU. Now, there was clearly a recognition that the Iranians were apparently softening or willing to talk. And so the United States had to respond in some fashion. Uh, but I don't think I, I never saw any movement toward weakening sanctions. And they were pretty effective. When you consider that uh, Iran's oil exports had dropped by half, and this is particularly in the last, uh, what, nine months of rapidly declining oil prices, they were really painful. Moreover, it couldn't get its hands on hard currency. Even when uh, it would um, sell uh, goods to a country like China, for example, um, the proceeds from those sales had to remain within China uh, because of the EU sanctions, or uh, because of the UN sanctions. So um, I, I think the, uh, the uh, administration probably overplayed that. Uh, whether they could have lasted uh, very much longer if the Iranians had been very aggressive in showing their willingness to negotiate an agreement is another question. But certainly in the near term, I didn't see them weakening. At the beginning, you talked about uh, the president surrendering an advantage and how, um, as someone who's negotiated um, a, a lot, uh, one must never do that. What's your sense of why the president 
did that so soon after taking office? Why, why did he surrender that advantage? Uh, that's trying to put my, you know, myself in, in the head of President Obama, and I'm, uh, I don't think I can do that. Um, uh, when I served in Iraq, it became very apparent to me that his overriding mission was to get American troops out of Iraq. Um, he had promised that in his campaign. It was certainly a major issue in, 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 in the 2008 elections. And, 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 and I think it, it, it just had a tremendous impact on him when uh, he became president and he realized that this problem was so serious and that if we didn't find any other way to deal with it, uh, we would have to employ military force. And having seen the debacle, the debacle, although it was corrected, I, I think, in Iraq, simply didn't want to go down that road. And he removed it from the table. Um, that's my own personal view. Uh, he just simply did not want to employ large numbers of American forces. Uh, I think that the same sort of logic went into his Uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that we could destroy all the nuclear facilities because some of them, for example, in Fordow, are deeply buried. The massive ordnance penetrator, yes. which is I mean, the one that, hold on, that, that just, Israel. You, and I'm just saying that even with the, the bunker buster, it's not clear, and I've talked to some military folks, that we could have inflicted the necessary damage at a place like Fordow, certainly at Natanz and Iraq, probably, okay? But I was speaking more broadly of the damage that we could inflict on Iran in general. But this president, I don't think, separated the use of those kinds of forces from ultimately having to deploy troops. And so he simply removed the military option in all of its manifestations, whether it's troops, whether it's the other weapons we have at our disposal. And he, now, of course, he never said that. But if, if you listen to the way he's talked about the option, or all options being on the, on the table, and if you listen to what others have said about it, this is clearly his thinking. He simply did not want to go down the road of addressing the nuclear problem in Iran with military force. Question about the inspectors. Um, you had mentioned that um, some of the inspectors might in fact be Iranian um, citizens. Um, what's your sense of uh, the degree to which that would be the only inspectors, or would there be outside inspectors allowed as well? Some of us have read about um, a prohibition of Americans being involved in the inspections regime, so who would be inspecting in addition to Iranians, if any? Almost all the inspectors are going to be from the IAEA, and, and I've heard the same things you have. I haven't been able to confirm it, that no inspectors may be American. Uh, but almost all the inspectors... Uh, uh, will be from the IAEA. But in the very limited case of those inspections that are to, to take place at the military facilities where questionable ac activities may have taken place, it is claimed, because again, this is in the secret, secret agreement that we haven't seen, it's only been reported, that um, the Iranians are saying that their inspectors under IA supervision will be doing the inspection. So it's, it's just a limited number. Uh, but nevertheless, it's, it's a point to consider, and it's a bit disturbing, uh, in my case. A question about the Europeans. Uh, it seems that among even conservative European leaders, there's generally more happiness with the agreement or support for the agreement than we're hearing from our elected representatives in Congress. How do you explain the, uh, the seeming uh, embrace of the agreement on the European side? I think some of the Europeans uh, took a more near-term focus. Uh, this has been very painful for them because the, the sanctions, for example, that the EU, EU ha has imposed ha have, been, have been taken or have been imposed 
at very strong, uh, as a result of very strong pressure by the United States. Um, I can't tell you the number of demarches that have been delivered to European capitals and to the EU Commission in, uh, in Brussels from the United States urging the EU to act on uh, stronger sanctions against Iran, not only for its nuclear program, but for um, its support of terrorism. Um, so this has always been a bit of a lift for, for the United States, and we, ulti we ultimately became successful only in about 2008, 2009. Um, and that's when the Iranians actually began feeling the pain because uh, Europe was a major uh, destination for many of its exports. Um, and they would much rather go back to the earlier days. Um, they didn't perceive the same threat that we did. Uh, the UK and France, maybe a little bit differently, but nevertheless, they never saw it in the way we have. Uh, they had a much stronger commercial interest in Iran um, uh, than we do. Uh, even with sanctions removed, I'm going to be surprised if we see uh, many American companies moving into Iran. Uh, very, very few. Maybe folks who are going to be helping in the export of carpets and pistachios. But other than that, um, I think uh, uh, American companies are going to be very wary about going in. But the uh, Europeans, definitely not the case. Oh, they're already going. Trade missions have been going from the day the agreement was signed. Given um, the deceit and cheating that has already happened in the past, why would anyone in the United States administration believe that Iran won't continue to behave in the exact same way? So you had talked earlier about you know, a transformational kind of moment and a belief that this will change everything. Where would that come from given the history that we've experienced? Well, of course, that's, that's the argument that many of uh, the critics of this ag agreement make, that um, uh, Iran was outed uh, twice for its Ill illegal nuclear weapons program. I can't remember the dates, but they were within, I think one was uh, around 2002, 2003, and then again around uh, 2008, uh, maybe even before that. Uh, but it very clear, everybody, uh, recognized it, uh, and additional sanctions were imposed because of it. So they clearly have violated it, violated it at least twice and been caught at it. Um, we suspect that they probably have done more and not been caught. And so it's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a valid question. Having violated these, uh, these, uh, the non-proliferation treaty before, why would, they, uh, why would we expect them to comply with, with this? Well, they get a lot more for it. Uh, I don't think they want to see these sanctions reimposed. Uh, I think if they're now taking the long view, which they should, uh, at the end of the expiration of many of these restrictions, uh, it will be able to put together a pretty impressive nuclear program, legally. Now, they still can't do weapons because they're a signatory to the NPT, and the NPT says you can't do that. And the, and the IAEA will be able to go in and inspect some, some, some facilities, but not all, uh, at the, when those uh, expire. So it's a valid question, and um, the, expect, the hope is that they see something to be gained from this, and they won't violate it. And if the administration's argument is correct, that perhaps this is going to change Iran, well, that would be great, and we have nothing to worry about. But again, that's a hope. And we usually don't do foreign policy on the basis of hope. Right. Um, just uh, two more questions. One, you had referenced um, in, in the uh, closing comments about ways that we can strengthen the agreement um, as it seems that it will uh, go through. And you talked about additional aid to Israel. Specific question about that aid. Um, B-52 bombers and bunker-busting bombs, is that on the table? Should it be on the table? Um, what kinds of hardware and what kinds of additional assistance do you think Israel might be expecting or should get? Uh, Israel currently has one type of the so-called bunker-buster bomb. Uh, it probably would not, in fact, it definitely wouldn't work against Fordow. Uh, the United States has uh, a, a weapon called a massive ordnance penetrator, uh, which is, uh, it's believed can reach uh, uh, some of the deeply buried facilities. We, it's never been tested. So we, well, it has been tested, but we don't know 
the exact engineering uh, details of some of its deeply uh, buried facilities, so we don't know how effective it would be. But there has been talk about giving the massive ordnance penetrator to uh, Israel as well, and I think it should be on the table. Now, I don't know how that particular weapon can be delivered. I mean, Israel does has at its disposal a number of American aircraft capable of delivering, delivering heavy ordnance, but I don't know whether it could do that. The B-52 certainly could. Um, the B-1, which we don't employ anymore in the active air force, could also do it. Uh, that's basically, um, I don't think even Air Force Reserve units fly. I don't have any Air Force Reserve folks around here, but I don't think we fly the B-1s. But the B-1 can certainly do it and could probably penetrate um, uh, the, the radar systems. Uh, so these certainly are legitimate um, concerns to be put on the table. And I'm sure the administration is giving some thought to those. The concern is if Israel uses them. That's what we don't know. And if you give them to them, you can't say, but. No, you give them to them and go with God. A question about North Korea. Um, are there any connections or, or concerns about um, uh, any type of um, alliance or involvement between Iran and North Korea? And has that been part of the conversation as far as you know? Uh, we know for a fact that in the early days of uh, Iran's uh, weapons development program that there was considerable uh, exchange between North Korea and, um, and Iran. By the way, the very first country to help in the development of a nuclear program in Iran was the United States. Uh, this was before the 79 revolution on, under the Shah, under the, I think it was called Adams for Peace. We, uh, we helped them uh, create a nascent uh, nuclear power plant. Um, the French have helped, the Chinese have helped, then it started moving into the gray area uh, with the Chinese and the Russians. Um, I have no doubt that the, um, uh, they've done a lot, but they're probably moving quite a bit along to the point where they may not need the North Koreans anymore. Uh, um, they seem to be doing pretty well without them. Uh, one last question about uh, related to North Korea, and then and then really a final question. Um, there are some who've said, "Look, North Korea has a bomb. Pakistan has a bomb. Um, so far, they haven't used it, nor um, have they given it or exported it to terrorists." Um, how do you respond to those who would say, "So what if I what if Iran got a bomb? What would that mean? Would that mean tomorrow the annihilation of Israel and the region and the West?" Or would they behave the way other powers that we wish hadn't ever gotten a bomb, but who now have a bomb, behave? I cannot imagine in Iran with a nuclear weapon that would be tolerated, certainly by Israel, but not even by Saudi Arabia, and possibly not by Egypt and some of the other Arab countries. Um, this visceral antipathy that the Saudis hold for Iran is uh, something you almost have to see to believe. Um, I mean, I never could understand it. It, it is definitely Sunni Shia. Um, and uh, I just, if Iran were to be on track to get a nuclear weapon, uh, I'm very, very confident that Saudi Arabia would move very quickly to also acquire a weapon. And they've got the checkbook for it. Um, and also not known to many people, but um, there has been pretty close communication between Saudi Arabia and Pakistan about Pakistan's um, nuclear rocket force. And uh, there are even claims that the, that the Saudis have helped pay for it. So uh, I suspect that if it appeared to the Saudis that Iran either had a bomb or, is a, or had the capability, that they would get one too. So now what have we got? We've got, uh, we've got uh, the, the Middle East worse than sitting on a knife edge. Um, and uh, they don't have the command and control systems that we have in the United States or that the other nuclear powers have. Uh, they have a lot more issues out there that could launch them into uh, a frenzy, a military frenzy that would involve a nuclear attack. So. It's highly destabilizing. North Korea is different. And finally, I'll just say, 
I mean, North Korea said some pretty nasty things, but I don't think they ever threatened to wipe Japan off or South Korea off the face of the earth. They just, so then that is a big difference. Final question, um, and maybe the hardest one of all. Uh, we Jews typically like to conclude particularly um, a difficult conversation with what we call a nechemta, something that's comforting or hopeful. Um, given everything that you've shared with us tonight, um, we might be hard pressed to end with something that could um, give us cause to hope. Um, but I'm wondering what, um, when you wake up in the middle of the night with, with concerns, is there anything that soothes your soul and comforts you and helps you to feel like, well, it might not be quite as bad as, as we fear? Well, like I said, I think we're, this agreement goes according to its, it, its components. Uh, you know, we got 10, 15 years to work with this. And there are actions that we can take to ensure that, it, that, that um, some of the things that we want out of it, in addition to what's in it, uh, can be achieved. And, and I'm hoping that we, we do those things. And it's going to require uh, the president, both this one, and the next one, and the one after the next one, uh, to work very closely uh, with our Congress, and, and, and we haven't been doing it very well the um, last few, few years, uh, and, and with our allies, to make sure that at the end of the day, Iran never has the ability to, uh, or never has uh, a nuclear weapon. I also want, want to say, uh, because I've been fairly critical of this, but I do understand our, our uh, uh, equally critically important role in the world, that um, when we get into an agreement like this, and I've, uh, multilateral negotiations are terrible. This is why the UN is kind of such a mess. I mean, it's just hard to get people to agree. The bilaterals are great. You're just across the table and you work it out. Multilateral just adds increasing dimensions of complexity. And in this particular case, we had the P5 plus one plus the EU. So really seven on one side, one on the other. The Iranians only had to worry about their issues. We had to worry about all the others, from the British to the French to the Chinese to the Russians to the EU and Germans. Um, very, very hard. And, 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 and I'm sure that that played some role in the outcome of these negotiations. Um, the other thing is that when the United States goes into a negotiation, uh, it's just, it's really impressive, the, the, the force we bring to bear. Um, the State Department had the lead in these negotiations. Um, and, and I knew two of the negotiators personally quite well, Bill Burns and then uh, Wendy Sherman. Wendy took over from Bill when Bill retired. Um, two extraordinary diplomats. Bill was a, was a career diplomat and probably uh, one of the finest diplomats ever in U.S. history career diplomat. Uh, so I have great faith and trust in those two. Uh, we had to bring in the Department of Energy, and there are many, many experts, because they are the ones who manage anything having to do with nuclear weapons in the United States. It's not the Air Force or the Navy who actually controlled the delivery vehicles. The weapons, those come out of the Department of Energy. So we had to call on the expertise of those nuclear folks in the Department of Energy, including the Sec Secretary of Energy himself. But, you know, there are people, for example, in the Defense Department and CIA who have made a career out of following Iran's missile program, or uh, nuclear program, and its missile program, who knew it quite well. All of these people were involved. I'm sure we had literally hundreds of people, not at the negotiating table, but in the back room, feeding intelligence, doing analysis of all the technical, and boy, this is a really, I've read the agreement, some of the sections, four or five times, uh, the level of detail, uh, is pretty extraordinary. Certainly, when it comes to the nuclear aspects of this, the technical aspects, uh, you're not going to find anybody in the State Department that knows about these kinds of things, designs of centrifuges and their capabilities and so forth. So we brought a massive number of people, and all of these people are very well-intentioned. Uh, they care about their country, just as all of us. And so I believe, in, at the end of the day, that they may have done the best they could. I just don't know about the leaders who, who finally agreed on this, because at the end of the day, there's only one person who makes the decision. 
And uh, I, I don't know what, what was in his mind. I, I don't. I'd like to think the best. Uh, but we do have 10 to 15 years, and uh, we're going to have to make it work. I want to thank everybody for being here. Um, I want to thank you, Ambassador Grappo, for sharing your wisdom, your expertise, your time, your energy with us. We're deeply grateful to you. I want to wish everybody Shana Tova, Mituka, a sweet and happy new year. May it be for us, for Israel, for the whole world, a year of blessing and a year of peace. Whatever concerns we bring to it, let's pray for shalom for us and for the world. Thank you, everybody, for being here.